Funding for this broadcast was provided by the law firm of Schlanger, Mills, Mayer, and Silver. U.S. Assistant Surgeon General Dr. Susan Blumenthal has dedicated her life to improving health care. Fifty percent of the cause of the ten leading killers of Americans are related to behavioral, lifestyle, and environmental factors um, like smoking, poor diet, lack of physical activity, unsafe sexual practices. These are things that we can change. Join me as I talk with Dr. Blumenthal about her mission to help shape America's health policy. My guest today is a champion for improving the health of Americans. Dr. Susan Blumenthal is currently U.S. Assistant Surgeon General, Rear Admiral, and Senior Science Advisor in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where her work focuses on a broad range of public health and science issues facing the nation. She is an internationally recognized medical expert and leader who has been a major force in bringing important public health issues, including women's health, disease, and violence prevention to scientific and public attention. Most recently, she has been involved in the national public health response to terrorism. Welcome, Dr. Blumenthal. It's my pleasure to be here. Let's start there. Tell us about what is happening to prepare our country for terrorism. Well, we have developed a national plan uh, to beat and defeat uh, terrorism in our nation, to be ready. Um, the government, under President Bush's direction and with Secretary Thompson, uh, we, working with the Bioterrorism and Emergency Response Plan, have brought together uh, our states, uh, our federal government, uh, local communities to be prepared. And that means bringing uh, public health experts, mental health experts, um, al along with law enforcement and people at the local, state, and federal level to develop a national strategy. And a uh, key piece of that is, is mental health, because if you think about it, um, the terror part of terrorism is to make people afraid, to change the way they live, yes. um, whether they means that they won't go to the movies, go shopping, um, and that, of course, would have a terrible impact on a nation's economy. If you think about it, um, you know, 41,000 people die every year in accidents, car accidents. 3.4 million are injured, but we get in our car every day. Uh, we've appraised the risk. With terrorism, with particularly bioterrorism, people um, are very afraid, and they don't understand what the risk is. And that's why uh, we as a nation need to be prepared. All families should have an emergency plan in the very unlikely uh, incidents that they would be affected by a terrorism event. That's a very, very minuscule chance. But really to be prepared, to have a sense of control, as well as to be um, ready for any other emergency that might affect them, like a hurricane or an earthquake. That practice and rehearse and be prepared really is such an important approach. When I was a, a child, we had the Korean conflict, and mm -hmm. even though it probably wouldn't have helped, we all put ourselves under our desks in school and had air raids and so forth, and it gave us a sense of calm and security. and that went a long way to good mental health. Well, I think that's true. I think families need a family safety plan to begin with. Actu after all, accidents are the fifth leading cause of death in America. And many people think that accidents are sort of predestined. But the fact is there's a lot uh, families can do to decrease accidents, whether it's um, safe driving, wearing your seatbelt, um, whether it's uh, making sure you install smoke detectors in the house and that they're working, whether it's uh, developing a response uh, kit uh, in terms of ha making sure you have flashlights and a radio um, and a, a small uh, battery-operated television to be prepared. These are the kinds of things that families should do and also to rehearse um, what would happen if there was an emergency. And it's a reaction, really, isn't it? Reaction time. If children are prepared and they know who to speak to and if mom's not there, go to the teacher and who's the next person if the teacher's not available. And also the idea that children 
really take their lead and cue from their parents. That's so right. Parents shouldn't burden their children with their own fears. Uh, children very much will pick up what the parents' anxiety. So I think parents need to work through their own feelings. After all, everyone's had some emotional reaction uh, after the terrorist events, uh, whether it's anxiety, whether it's sadness, fear. Um, for many, those symptoms are abating. Um, we're a very resilient nation, but for others, they will uh, persist. And for those people in the eight affected states in the District of Columbia, uh, many will have a post-traumatic stress disorder or depression and need help. And people should not feel like um, that it is a weakness or a character flaw to have uh, an emotional reaction. Uh, help is there and it is very effective. And that people have access to help. So many times people feel isolated, that there's no place to go. We know now that there are a lot of public approaches, that there are ways to get help that have to do with our own resources. Right, that's true. There are there are a lot of places to go for help. Um, uh, you can go to your uh, family doctor, to a mental health provider. There are 800 numbers to call for resources and websites um, that will give you more information. But the most important message is really to get help. Help will be effective. And with children, sometimes just a little extra time, you know, a little, little less media, a little more storytelling and cuddling does a lot for support. Well, reassurance is very important, and, and social support and love are very important um, for all families. Um, you know, there have been studies that have shown that, for example, women with breast cancer who participate in support groups, men after heart attacks who have more friends and family, they live longer. Um, so we know that social support is a very profound um, a buffer against disease as well as to help us live longer and healthier You're lives. talking really about reestablishing a sense of community, aren't you? Well, community is very important, and community is very important in public health uh, response. Um, public health uh, delivers interventions at the individual, but also at the community level. And, um, and that's why I think today prevention is one of the, the key issues facing our nation. You know, when we talk about terrorism, we say be prepared. Um, we're really talking about um, prevention. And um, it's much better to prevent something than to have to intervene once it's happened. Um, we have had a sick care system, not a health care system. We spend only 3 to 5 percent of a $1.2 trillion health care budget on population-based prevention. And that's why we really need to um, change the paradigm and to work on preventing disease before it happens in the first place. Think about it. 50% of the cause, 50% of the cause of the 10 leading killers of Americans are related to behavioral, lifestyle, and environmental factors um, like smoking, poor diet, lack of physical activity, unsafe sexual practices. These are things that we can change uh, at the individual and community level. Isn't that amazing? When you think of a sink as a, a visual with the taps just running, 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 we've spent so much time just mopping up the floor, and you're telling us to turn off the faucets. That's right. Well, Secretary Thompson and President Bush have made this a real key issue. Um, we want to be, I, and I think that after 9 11, um, you know, we came together as a nation. And um, I think uh, we now need to make the prevention of disease to make our nation healthier, as healthy in, in heart and body as we have become in spirit. And I think that um, there are a number of things to do. And there's a prescription for a healthier future that all Americans can uh, engage in. The first is, is really not to smoke. Um, it's the number one best thing you can do for your health. It turns out that one in five deaths in America are attributable to smoking. And um, uh, you know, Mark Twain said it's easy to stop smoking. I've done it hundreds of times. Um, and that's why we need to really start with kids. Because it turns out that if you don't begin smoking by your 19th birthday, you probably never will. 90% of adult smokers begin as teenagers. So uh, that's why we've really targeted our anti-tobacco messages to stop kids from smoking. Because 3,000 kids will begin smoking every day in America. One third will die of their addiction. So how do you make it hip to be fit? <laughs> well, I think it's a number of ways. I mean, first is um, to engage um, at the school level, uh, to have positive role models, to have um, young people uh, deliver that message, 
uh, both at the uh, using the media campaigns as well as at the community level in schools, identifying um, leaders. Um, we've engaged. Um, uh, school-based groups like the Girl Scouts um, in a, a no smoking prevention campaign to, to get that no smoking message out. Um, we want to get faith-based uh, organizations involved in these messages as well because the community plays a vital role in prevention. I think also um, we're focusing more on gender and racial differences and finding that no one way of changing behavior uh, exists, that we have to target our messages to specific groups in order to be effective. After all, what's going to change a man's behavior is going to be, vis-a-vis -vis smoking, is going to be very different than a teenage girl's behavior. And so many of our studies are male research, really. That's right. Um, women's health was neglected uh, in the halls of public policy, at the research bench, and in clinical settings. And that's an area I was very involved in, was to help expose the inequities in women's health in the early 1990s, and then to move women's health to the front burner of our nation's health care agenda, where it belongs. And we always think in our culture of heart disease as the number one, and it may be the number one killer, for people and obesity has such a part of that mm -hmm. and in a culture that basically gives you a toy with the food and kids growing up thinking that soda is another candy almost what can you do to rethink this problem of nutrition and diet as it relates to health obesity and lack of physical activity next to smoking is the second preventable cause of death in America 300,000 deaths every year are attributable to um, uh, these causes. So it is a huge opportunity for prevention. Um, the shocking fact is that we have a growing epidemic of uh, obesity and lack of physical activity. A uh, recent Surgeon General's report found that 61% of Americans are overweight. And we found that 40% of Americans get no physical activity whatsoever. And 7 out of 10 of Americans um, uh, don't meet the federal guidelines for physical activity. There's also been a growing epidemic of childhood and adolescent obesity with a tripling in rates of obesity for kids over the past two decades. This is leading to another epidemic, which is a rise in diabetes, uh, which is a major killer of Americans. Um, today, there are 13 million people with diabetes, one third of them don't know that they have this disease. And again, there's been a quadrupling in rates of childhood uh, diabetes, a disease that when I went to medical school, we never heard of in terms of uh, being affecting children. Again, this is linked to the lack of physical activity and to uh, overweight among children in America. So, Dr. Blumenthal, what can we do? <laughs> well, I think we have to change our relationship to food and, and physical activity. Um, first of all, we need to get across some very simple messages, and we have to start young um, with children. Um, we have to make it a family adventure as well as a community commitment um, to change these relationships. And I think that, first of all, there are some simple things we can do. Um, to, we need to eat um, smart, which means that it's a, a diet rich in fruits and fiber and vegetables that's low in fat, keeping our, our fat to about 30% of our calories, um, and that's also um, uh, full of vitamins and calcium to promote healthy bones. I think we... Um, we released a certain general report on physical activity. Note we don't use the word exercise anymore because physical activity is something we can all do. It means just moving 30 minutes a day, five days a week, and it doesn't even have to be continuous. 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there. Pick an activity you like, gardening, dancing. So what you're saying is it's not about shoulds and shouldn'ts, but it's really changing the model. Changing the model. Making it really possible by Increments. And in fact, um, a, sm a small community in uh, Iowa made it a community project to lose weight and, and get more active. And in 10 weeks, this community lost two tons. That's 4,000 pounds. Uh, they uh, walked together. They took up kickboxing as an activity. They, instead of the fish fry on Friday night, they had a healthy food night. And um, this community was very, very successful and I think serves as a model for what communities can do together. 
Um, so I think as individuals, as families, as communities, we can change our relationship with food and with activity. And you're also speaking about, for example, cancer patients that sit in groups and live longer even though they may be uh, terminally ill by just interacting with one another. That brings me further into this period of life where I sit, which is middle life, and estrogen and estrogen replacements and so forth. Tell us about what women can do, what's the new thinking on estrogen, and also about groups like this where women at midlife, instead of withdrawing, reconnect to one another. Well, um, if you were to um, walk through a graveyard in the year 1900, women died on average, and men, at age 48. And we died of infectious diseases like um, smallpox and diphtheria and tuberculosis and women also have complications of childbirth. Well, in this century, because of public health interventions such as sanitation and immunization, um, also uh, later on antibiotics and federal health programs, we um, have extended the human lifespan by almost 30 years. So in the year 1900, women died before menopause. Uh, now women will live one third of their lives after menopause. So healthy aging for both men and women becomes a top national health priority. Um, today, um, you know, probably one in eight Americans is over the age of 65, but it's estimated by the year 2030, uh, one in five Americans will be over the age of 65. Well, the poet Robert Browning uh, wrote, grow old with me, the best is yet to be. And I think that's why um, it's critical that we focus in on healthy aging. And it means at every stage of the life cycle, there are things we can do, whether it's um, eating a good diet, getting that physical activity, um, having social support, using stress busters, finding a way that will decrease the stress in your life. Now, the issue that you raised about hormone replacement therapy uh, is one that I think is on a lot of women's minds as they um, uh, enter the menopausal period. And um, I think the paradigm there is shifting, too. Again, now that we're doing the research on women's health, we've, we're supporting a large study. It's the largest clinical trial ever conducted in America, the Women's Health Initiative. And it's looking at the risk factors for disease and disability in women um, after menopause. And it's also the first prospective study of the effects, the, 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 the benefits, and the possible side effects of hormone replacement therapy. What we're finding is that, um, that the risk of, of heart attack and stroke and, and deep venous clots actually goes up when women begin, slightly, when women begin hormone uh, replacement therapy. So we don't think that um, it's a good treatment for heart disease. There are other drugs that, that can treat it effectively. And we're wondering whether or not it, it actually does prevent heart disease. So we'll be waiting for the results of this study in the year 2005 to know definitively. In the meantime, other studies have also suggested that there may be a slight increase in the risk of breast cancer, uh, particularly after uh, a decade of use. So again, the thinking is changing. Again, the use of hormone replacement therapy is very much now an individual decision that a woman should make in partnership with her physician, looking at what her symptoms are at menopause, if she has them, what her risk is for heart disease and breast cancer, and deciding what makes sense for her while we wait for the results of these major studies. That's wonderful because what you're really saying is we have to be our own partner, our own advocate, and be knowledgeable and know what's out there. That's true. Knowledge is power is when power. it comes to our health. And there are a number of uh, trustworthy and reliable resources um, in the government. Uh, we have a number of 800 numbers that you can find if you look under, um, you, you know, you want to call uh, or go to the web, healthfinder.gov. Um, we'll take you into uh, a lot of fact sheets on health information as well as 800 numbers you can call. Uh, for reliable information. And that's something wonderful that you've done. You've really organized access. People so ma many times don't know there is help out there. And uh, something I got off of that was that the first year after you start using estrogen, you're more vulnerable in the heart arena. But after that, that slows down and you're more stabilized. Is that correct? 
Actually, it's um, the science is showing that the risk continues. Oh, the reverse on the continues. studies. So, um, um, so that the slight increased risk has continued. Um, we initially thought that it goes down after two yes. years, but the Women's Health Initiative has showed that the risk continues. continues. Mm -hmm. That's important. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you a bit about the rise in HIV and AIDS in women. Mm -hmm. Well, again, like uh, lung cancer, which in the 30s women didn't get, um, it was considered just to be a man's disease. So we didn't focus our prevention efforts on women. And now it's the number one cancer killer of women, lung cancer. Similarly, AIDS was thought to be just a man's disease in the 80s. Um, and so we targeted our prevention research efforts to men. Um, as a result, uh, women didn't realize they were vulnerable to the virus. And um, the disease rates have grown so that women are among the fastest growing groups afflicted with HIV AIDS. It went from 7% of the, the cases in 1985 being women to now 26% of the cases. So women need to know that um, they are vulnerable and they need to protect themselves. And um, we're now doing, though, the research and we're targeting our prevention efforts to women. I think another issue is that with the um, development of some of these new drugs to treat uh, AIDS for the first time in recent history, AIDS has dropped off of the leading killers of Americans because it's being turned for those people who take advantage of the drugs into a chronic disease. But what it's obscuring is the fact that the rates of HIV infection are continuing to grow in our nation's young people. Yes. So we mustn't become complacent about this disease. And remember also that worldwide, uh, HIV is wiping out a generation of, of people in, in Africa and some other countries. And remember today that health is a global issue, that the spread of infectious diseases like AIDS or tuberculosis of uh, toxins like tobacco, of the threat of bioterrorism, no, no state or national boundaries. And in the final analysis, this issue of terrorism, what is the government doing in relation to terrorism? The government is doing a great deal uh, to beat and defeat terrorism, to be prepared. There are several components of the national response. The first is to be prepared, uh, to bring together people at the local, state and federal levels, uh, the emergency responders, the health care providers, mental health specialists, along with law enforcement. The second thing um, that we're doing is in, in the Department of Health and Human Services is to strengthen our health alert system so that um, if an unusual occurrence occurs, we're able to communicate um, with all of our communities and to detect if there's an unusual like outbreak of flu-like symptoms or, or people buying flu medicines um, and a ways of of, uh, getting the messages out to all communities. Um, we're also uh, developing an unprecedented stockpile of antibiotics and vaccines and other medical supplies so that if uh, an incident occurs, um, communities will have the resources they need. And the fourth piece is really research. Research, research is medicine's field of dreams from which we um, harvest new findings about the causes, treatment, and prevention of disease. So we're developing new antibiotics with fewer side effects, new vaccines with fewer side effects, um, so that uh, we'll have a new generation of uh, effective uh, methods to both prevent and treat uh, if a bioterrorist uh, attack should occur. And really, the, I guess the fifth piece has to also include personal responsibility, that people have to stay alert and pay attention to what the government has to offer. I think that, again, at the individual level, everyone needs to be alert, uh, to be vigilant, but also um, to go about their life. It's too big a tax to pay uh, for terrorism, uh, not to get on with the freedoms and the liberties that we enjoy as Americans. Who was it who said, you have nothing to fear but fear itself? Churchill. Yes, Churchill. <laughs> and he also said, you know, we're living in a, a nation um, that's warmed by the courage of unity. And I think our nation has uh, been become stronger and more resilient. Um, and I think uh, the bottom line is that for a prescription for a healthier future is that at the individual level, there are steps we can take as, as people, as families, at the community to come together. Uh, and as a federal government, um, assistance we can provide to communities, information we can provide to individuals to ensure a healthier, healthier and safer America in the 21st century. Now I'm going to ask you a question that's personal. I want you to tell us, what was the defining moment in your life? 
Well, when I was 10 years old, my mother developed thyroid cancer, and I'll never forget visiting her hospital room and seeing on the uh, door a large sign with a skull and crossbones. Um, she was being given radioactive iodine to treat her cancer, and she'd become too hot to handle, too hot to give a child's kiss. And I remember the fear and the helplessness at the disease, and it was shortly thereafter that I decided I was going to become a doctor. Well, in my first year of college, she developed breast cancer, and in my last uh, year of medical school, the disease metastasized to her spine so that this beautiful intelligent woman could no longer walk. Um, she fought the disease with great courage and dignity and she lived long enough to see her daughter become a doctor. Well I vowed then and there that no other woman should have to suffer the way she did. So that's why it's been um, a real honor uh, and a mission for me to have the opportunity to work to improve women's health and the public health of our country. It's been an honor for us today. Thank you, Dr. Blumenthal. Thank you, Dr. Gross, for the opportunity to, to talk today. Dr. Blumenthal, it's great to cover such a wide variety of health issues with you. It reflects the fact that you have been a major force in developing a coordinated national approach to health that dramatically increases all our awareness of these very important issues. Thank you for joining us. I'm Dr. Gail Gross. See you next time. Funding for this broadcast was provided by the law firm of Schlanger, Mills, Mayer, and Silver.